What's up, party people? It's your girl, Nicole Bannister, aka Nikki Bands, coming to you live from Cape Town, South Africa. Today I'm interviewing Terrell J. Star right here on Nikki Bands Live! <laughs> Hello, 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 you gorgeous humans. What a vibe. How lovely to see all of you right here and back with me on Nikki Bands Live. This is your favorite interview series where every single Tuesday I am bringing you the dopest, most exclusive interviews with some of the most fascinating people across the globe, whether they are actors, activists, entrepreneurs, dancers, rappers, journalists. Your girl Nikki Bands is interviewing a brand new guest from a brand new country every single week and today's guest I'm telling you is gonna be absolutely flawless it's gonna be a vibe I've got the boy Terrell J star with me here today and I am so 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 excited to bring him on and for you all to hear from him Terrell is an incredible journalist and foreign policy expert who focuses on all sorts of fascinating places but mostly places in the biggest conflict in the world I'm talking Ukraine I'm talking Russia I'm talking Iran I'm talking Sudan I'm talking Palestine and it's actually incredible the work that he does as a black journalist traveling across the globe and getting these exclusive stories and sharing them with you and with the world so I'm really really excited to have Terrell on Terrell I'm gonna bring you on in just a moment but just want to say party people thank you thank you thank you I know I did not have the show last week we took the Tuesday off because the girl Nikki Bands was in the studio as many of you know my YouTube series started up which is an incredible social entrepreneurship competition where university students from all over the globe from India, from Colombia, from Ecuador, from Kenya are competing for $50,000. They are competing for a $50,000 cash prize and we were in the studio filming last week. We're not done filming yet, but we're super excited about it. It's season two, baby. Season one is up on my YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel yet, youtube.com slash at Nicole Bannister, AKA Nikki Bands. You can go watch season one of Start It Up. It's four episodes. It's a mini series. It's such good vibes. It has 5 million views on YouTube, so you need to go be number 5 million in one. And season two is coming out very soon in June. So I didn't have the show last Tuesday because I was in the studio. And y'all, y'all don't even know. Studio days, I'm literally in the studio from 6 a.m. To like 10 p.m. Seriously, like you, beyond a 12-hour day when we're when we're filming, it's literally, literally, literally crazy. Uh, shout out to my girl Carrie in the chat. Share where the jacket is from. The jacket is from Top Shop. Okay, we got the little camo print, but you know, make it fem, make it fem. So it's from Top Shop. Shout out to Carrie in the building. Shout out to everybody who's here. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for tuning in every single Tuesday here on Nikki Bands Live with me, your girl, Nikki Bands. And if you haven't followed me on Instagram yet, go ahead and do that at they call me Bands, B-A-N-Z, B-A-N-Z, depending on where, you know, in the world that you are. And you can come rock with us every single Tuesday. All right, party people, I don't want to take up any more time in this intro because it is time to get Terrell on. I'm telling you, this is going to be a phenomenal interview. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for rocking with me. Please continue to share. Please continue to save. Please continue to amplify these stories across the globe. And we're going to get Terrell on right now so you can learn more about his story and his background and his journey to where he is today. And I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that you learn something new. And I hope that this show allows you to always shift your perspective and to hear from people that you've never heard from before and to make the world a better and more inclusive place. You already know the vibes. Okay, party people, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Well, I'm ready. All right, let's get a little drum roll going. I'm going to bring on Terrell J. Star right now, journalist, foreign policy expert, return Peace Corps volunteer, Fulbright scholar, da 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 The accolades just go on and on and on. I'm going to bring him on right now. Here we go. <laughs> Let's get it. Hello. I'm doing fantastic. Hey, how how are you, Terrell? Always good. Oh, I'm always good. You know that. That's yeah, exactly the energy that I need here on Nikki Bands Live. I appreciate you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. 
Of course, hey, I'm glad <laughs> to be invited. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually trying to, you know, you see what I'm doing, I'm fumbling with my lighting, and so I'm doing more video work right now, and I don't have a producer on site at the moment, and so this is a job that I usually um, assign to someone else but I'm doing it on my own and you see the results of it, so I'm doing the best I can. Hey, well, the lighting looks great. We can see those pearly whites. We can see you, you, we can see you perfectly clear. So you look great to me. All right, all right. Oh my gosh, good, I'm telling you, good, all I good. use is a ring light and a microphone. I'm telling you, it's worked wonders, I promise. Oh, okay, good deal. All good right, deal. Terrell, well, I always like to start off every episode of Nikki Van's Life by telling people how I know the guests who are on my show. And so you and I met in Washington, D.C. back in February. We were both recipients of the 2023 Franklin H. Williams Award. And so this is an award uh, bestowed upon return Peace Corps volunteers of color who have demonstrated to outstanding impact to the United States government and to the ideals of the Peace Corps, even beyond their Peace Corps service. So we were on that stage together. We met in D.C. Big congrats to you uh, on your award. <laughs> You as well, exactly, you exactly. Thank you. But it was amazing. I can tell right off the bat, I can tell from your energy, you being on stage. Like when I meet people who are also like in an industry where they're on camera a lot, I'm just so drawn to them because your stage presence, your energy is always just phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, it's one of those things that you learn how to do. And as I have moved into media, I have become more conscious of how I present to people. And a lot of that includes, uh, you know, the aesthetic part of it. But then also, I consider myself to be a pretty happy person. And I, I spend so much of my time talking about all of the major conflicts of the world that, that really are, are very painful. But what I try to do is to be that reassuring voice to tell people that not only about what the conflict is, but to let everyone know that we actually are supposed to live in this world peacefully together. And it's actually a possible thing that could be achieved. And, you know, it takes a lot of effort to present the positive version of yourself to the world and to give positive energy. One of the favorite, one of my yeah. favorite people who do this is Omarion. And he, he, he's, he's um, King Unbothered, the King of Unbothered. You know, he has that moniker. And I learn a lot from him. Because no one is no no one um, has a I don't have a right to, to to give people my version of my bad day right you know I, I give people the absolute best of who I am and I'm glad that you saw that because that's the type of energy well, I, I like to put out into the saw world that on the stage and I see that in your podcast the Black Diplomats podcast I see that in your interviews as well and I'm really glad that you actually started off with that because I feel like. Sometimes it's tough with journalists. And I've, I've had a number of journalists on Nikki Bands Live before. And I think it's kind of tough because oftentimes when you're on camera, you're reporting about something. You're talking about something else, right? And I feel like Nikki Bands Live is an opportunity to dive deep into you and who you are. You know, doing all my research, watching all your videos on YouTube, nobody was talking about you, Terrell. So we're going to get into it. We're going to dive into you as the human and the person today, which I'm super excited about. <laughs> Oh, yeah, let's uh, do we're it. doing it. We're doing it. And I think, you know, you talking about having this disposition of trying to always bring your best self and always trying to like spread these messages of peace and positivity throughout the world. That's a really hard thing to do sometimes in foreign affairs and international affairs, because there are there's so many challenges happening in the world, right? There's wars, there's famine, there's there's all these things that make it really challenging to, to be like that. So I'm curious for you to talk to us about when you when you when you got the bug, you know, when did you realize that foreign affairs, uh, foreign policy, when did you realize that was your passion and that was something that you wanted to do and, and, and discuss for the rest of your life? I was a freshman at Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas. This is back in 1998. I turned 43 this year and I just returned from Philander from, for their graduation a couple of years ago, right? I, I was here at their commencement and I was given an award for my foreign affairs work. And I start off with Philander because that was the place where I got my passport. I did not think about traveling 
when I was growing up. Not that I didn't want to, but just didn't have the exposure. And on little historically black colleges, I went to a black school. You know, you have those people who look at you and say, hey, you may be good for this or that. And, uh, the trip was to Senegal, and it was for eight or nine days. And the thing that really stuck out to me was that I enjoyed the environment and scenery of the airport. I like seeing the different types of people from wherever they're from, trying to get their flight to their flights. Because what I recognize now is that based on how they dress, they were dressing to be the version of themselves when they return to their home countries. Because here, sometimes they may be different. You know, they, they may not have the same type of garb on here in the States that they would traditionally wear back in the States. And so all that fascinated me. I enjoyed being on the airplane. I never had a problem sleeping in the air. I know that's a struggle for a lot of people, but there has not been a time when I've traveled over this overseas wow. and I didn't sleep like a baby. So just the basic functions of it was drawn to me. So my body just spiritually was acclimated to that. And then going into Africa, to, to Senegal, I felt at home. Now, mind you, with Black folk, we many of us don't know where we're from. And But the first African country you go to, we say that's where we're from, right? So I... You know, it's, 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 just a, it's just a thing, right? You know, so we, we adopt the country that, you know, in Africa that we, that we set our feet on first. And, and so um, basically, that was it. I really said, okay, I need to do more of this. And then I went to Haiti my junior year. And then from then my summer before my senior year, I went to Russia. But it was all at Philander Smith College. And then from there, I did uh, somebody, an alum at Philander, said, hey, you know, he's a former Peace Corps volunteer, told me that you would be a good person to go into Peace Corps. And I did just that. And it just wow, started from wow, there. Wow, wow, I'm really glad that you shared that story and that background, because I think, you know, for a lot of people joining who are not from the United States, maybe don't understand the United States context of being a Black American, so many of us, like you said, as Black Americans, we don't know what our African roots are because of the treacherous history of slavery in the United States. We were ripped away from those countries and from those cultures. So, uh, you know, and it's, it's actually one of the reasons why I have always referred to myself as Black American instead of African American. Because for me, I'm like, if your mom is from Nigeria and then you move to the U.S., you are African American. Me, I'm Black. I don't know where my right. roots are. I don't yeah. know where that history comes from. So for you to have that transformational experience in Senegal and then to keep it moving from there and keep exploring places that have this Afro uh, culture like Haiti, that's tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I think that it's that distinction, I think, is great because we have our own unique experience. And I think some people take it pejoratively to say that we don't want to align ourselves with Africa. And that's not true at all. I think that it speaks to the uniqueness of being a Black American. And it's cultural. And I think that's OK. And I think that we, one of the things that I've learned to do in my own reporting is to really um, explore those cultural distinctions that make us unique. Because I think um, it just, just makes mm. for a more understanding world. and. I, I, you know, when, when I, and I think that my experience as a Black American is distinct with that. Uh, my, um, from the continent of Africa. I hope you okay. hear me because you my head's on the side. There, so that's perfect. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So basically, I, um, I, you know, in my reporting, as I'm, I'm doing more uh, reporting from the, you know, on, on the continent because I'm doing some a uh, couple of um, segments on Sudan for my upcoming episode, and, you know they are dealing with white supremacy like we are in America, but it's different. And it fascinates me to learn more about what their distinct experiences are because I wasn't, um, I, I didn't delve into Africa much in my reporting because it's not my expertise. But now I have this real strong desire to think about the continent. And now, you know, I'm, I'm including it, some piece of it in every episode. And one of the things that I was really interesting yep. about you is that you're a Black and Iranian. And, and I, I'm working on a five-part series uh, about Iran, and it's in post-production right now. And the final person, you yes. know, we, she's a shared person, Priscilla, uh, dear friend. And so she 
Hers is the final wow. part of that five-part series. So she's taking it home and just mm -hmm. learning about her family's history <clears throat> and her life, you know, getting through Europe, right? And so, and, and she's also come to America, studied at NYU. I just love exploring the multiplicity yes. of what yes. Black Yes, and it's is. actually fascinating yeah. that you mentioned Priscilla because before last week when I took a break, so I was filming, Priscilla was my guest on the show representing the collective for Black Iranians. So mm. we're, we're keeping it all in the family here. And I love that you brought that up because you've actually done quite a bit of series and research on finding Blackness in places and in countries that are not predominantly Black. So you've done a series on Black Ukrainians. You've done a series and talked to Black Palestinians. You, you have this upcoming series about Black Iranians. And that is absolutely fascinating because these are not countries that you know, are the first or the top of mind when we think about Black people and where they reside. So what is it for you? What does it mean for you to find Blackness and to amplify it and to showcase it in places like Ukraine and Iran and Palestine? My passion right now, my primary passion has been for decades and will always be is Eastern Europe. And I just am interested in the region generally. Naturally, as a Black person who lives abroad, yeah. I want to know where other Black people are. And some people are perhaps wired differently. But in Ukraine, when I first traveled there in 2008, and then I went and earned my Fulbright uh, scholarship a year later, stayed for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be around Black people, you know. And, and, and I'm curious. And I don't know. I just think that it should be natural for any person, regardless of who they are, if they're from Asia, if they're from South America. I just think that culturally, people want to, they're mm -hmm. drawn to something that's familiar. And so turn into a simple interest, right, personally. Now, the uh, journalism part came when you start talking to them and you hear their stories and say, oh, I need to write about this or I need to tell other this. And this is when I was deciding that I wanted to be a journalist. And so how do you, what medium do you tell those stories through? Mm -hmm. And I just chose the tool of journalism. And so it started off from a personal interest of mine and then it grew to be professional. And what did you all, and it's important because being a foreign correspondent, we essentially are the editor. If you, especially if you're working at some place like the New York Times or Washington Post, those editors are based in New York, Washington, mm. DC, and elsewhere. They're not on the ground. And so those foreign correspondents have a lot of power about wow. what we see on our television screens. And I think that it's a responsibility for all correspondents. We have to be multi-cultural. Um, we have to be multicultural in our approach. Yeah. And I'm talking yeah. about the white ones too. You know, they 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 do. They need to be as culturally competent and multifaceted in their social surroundings as we as black people have to be, right? Because the thing that we as black folks and it's something that we all tell ourselves. We know white people more than they know themselves, right? And, and that's right. right. I mean, anybody, like, we, because we have to. And, and, and so when I travel abroad, it's my responsibility to show you the multi-dimensions multi of a society that you're in. So I'm in Ukraine. It's my responsibility to not only support those non-black or non-people of color uh, Ukrainians who are black, because I've done that, it's my responsibility as well to understand how that experience is for, for people from the continent of Africa and people from um, and people from India, for example. And I take great pride in that because people know that when they come to my podcast, when they see my social media, they see that there's representation. So last week I had a black Palestinian woman and you, you all are getting the sneak, you know, the preview. So this week, um, you know, I got Sudan and I got, um, and, and we got a, 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 a Iranian journal, uh, not Iranian, but a, um, a, um, Palestinian journalist and a Palestinian, um, you know, human rights lawyer that's going to be on the show. And then I got my Ukraine stuff. And then I got one segment where I talk about what Kamala Harris is doing. 
So you're going to get it. So all of this is foreign policy. And then sometimes you're going to get, you know, something domestic mm. that has an international dimension to it. So I take pride in having the most diverse foreign policy platform ever. When you come on my platform, you're going to see a representation of women. Roughly about 65% mm. of my guests are women. Half, half of them are women of color. A good, I would say, at least 30 to 40% are black women. Uh, and so, it, and, and, it's, and it's really, and I think that's the way that it should be across the board. But unfortunately, right. we know it's not. Right, exactly. We know why. Exactly. That's someone who... Uh went to Georgetown School of Foreign Service, I can certainly tell you, <laughs> I, I can certainly tell you yes. that foreign policy yeah. is not as simple or as inclusive as your podcast does, and as, as the Black Diplomats podcast makes it seem, uh, or as other reporters make it seem. That's something that we're so, so, so grateful for you, Terrell, and you do that so beautifully and so wonderfully. But I actually want to take it a step further, because it's one thing to have cross-cultural capital, which you obviously have tons of. You've lived all over the world. You've traveled all over the world. You make a concerted effort to understand the lived experiences and the languages and the backgrounds of the people that you're reporting on, um, which, like you said, foreign correspondents, that's a, that's a necessity, right? They need to do that. And you do that, and you do it very well. But beyond that, you have that, but then you also keep it Black. Okay, <laughs> like, I, you know, I've listened to a couple of your podcast episodes where you'll refer to MAGA Republicans as knuckleheads, you know, and then you'll, you'll go ahead and, 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 and just say things that are so relevant to Black culture. And that, to me, is an added level to what you do and an added level to your cross-cultural capital because you, you don't just make it okay for sort of regular people to understand or simple for regular people to understand. You actually make it okay for Black people to understand and Black Americans in particular, which I think is so critical and oftentimes a voice that's lost in the conversation around foreign policy. And so I can imagine that for you, when you started off in your career, I can imagine that maybe wasn't the easiest thing to do because we know what it means to be black in this world that we live in. So talk to us about your journey and how you were able to maintain your authentic black voice throughout all of your expert reporting. I believe that maintaining my black authentic voice has been a journey. When I, traveled to Georgia, my Peace Corps experience. Uh, I was the, we started off with 29 people. There was another black woman with me and she didn't finish, as you know, with Peace Corps. Uh, I don't know what your group was, but for a lot of reasons, it's not for everybody, right? And so some people don't finish for two years for a lot of reasons, you know, and so uh, they don't RPCV, um, and they don't COS, but basically close the service. I'm giving up these, um, Acronyms like every like the non -per, you know person who didn't do it knows it, but 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 at any rate, um, I think it was a journey. Um, I've gone through those years of self doubt, so this voice that I have, I've had it when I was about uh, mm -hmm. eleven years old, and I was wow. very self conscious about it. It was the people, and I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, which is the largest black city in the United States, and, and I'm not going. To to lie to you when I say that at times it was uh, it was a cultural adjustment to being around a majority of white Americans because people often ask me is it a cultural um, it, it, is it a cultural challenge uh, to be in Eastern Europe I say no my biggest cultural adjustment I've been to that American part. white people those, those, that that was a challenge not the Russians <laughs> or the Ukrainians or the people in the this or the Central right. Asians, it was the white people, right? And, you know, so it, it I grew more com comfortable with myself when I understood what my purpose was and my purpose was it ultimately is to be a black person who, who to be being a black person who has a very special understanding of the world not being afraid to express it because once I did and once I got into the flow that I am, I am in right now, I realized that my analysis and my life experiences are helping to make the world a better place. And the reason why I say Black diplomats is not because I want my platform to be exclusively Black because, as right, you know, it's not. It's not. it isn't. What it 
it, it, what, what it is is that I want black people to know that they can be diplomats in this world mm. and we have an equal mm. right at the table. So my so 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 my podcast is like the foreign ministry. It's the foreign ministry of ideas, right? I, I have my own intellectual sovereignty. I have my own um, you know, policy, and I have the right to sit with anyone from any part of the world and to articulate that. And we lean into our experiences because I grew up in, the, you know, in during the crack era of the 1980s. And black people come from all walks of life. I wow. came from an extremely poor one. Mm -hmm. Both my uncles so sold crack. My house was raided. I mean, you know, Biggie kicked down the floor, way being the four four. That was my life. I didn't do it, but I was on the business. I was on right. the business end of a, you know, right. I've been through all of that. And I tell people that the first diplomats that I met in my mm -hmm. life were my uncles who sold crack. Why do I say that? Because now that I'm doing briefings at the State Department, I'm at the embassies around the world interviewing people. I actually am working on an interview with some, you know, with some um, ambassadors in the next few weeks. Right. Everybody's selling product, right? Everybody's product. You can either call it crack or you can call it your right. form of democracy. It's product, okay? And you, and you want to get everyone high on your supply. That's what you want to do. And the difference is that as proud as I am as an American, I refuse to get high off of mine, right? So, and I think that as Black people, we understand that we can have this duality where we're very proud to be American, that we're very proud uh, to, to lean into where we come from. Right, because where I come from, one is a result of racist right. urban planning. Let's get that straight. And my uncles, for who they were, I, 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 the the podcast is dedicated to them, and it's not, not about them, as, you know, what they could be, how they could ascend to be me, but I want the world to know that these men, you know, had they had another option had they been able to not you know to to navigate that racist structural environment that was designed for them they themselves could have been doing the same work that i do of being diplomats or whatever and so i do this as much to let people know that this world that we are in is one that, we, that is by design and what i is i tell people that we have the power to change it and i start by using my life as an example and and you have to be confident in that because i go i'm telling you I, i've done briefings where i've told people first simple mess i know so crack you kind of, you know they're like oh okay it's interesting but people will be afraid to do that but i'm not because mm -hmm. my best work is leaning into who i am because they do and i don't spend a lot of time justifying myself or, or trying to explain myself. Um, I have my own analysis and I, you know, I can do the straight um, policy approach to what type of weaponry or platforms Ukraine needs in order to repel the, you know, the uh, Russian invasion or whatever. But what I think makes my work particularly valuable is the way that I can make Ukrainians who are considered white mm. to, to our communities relatable. Um, and, and they may not know Russian colonialism, they may not, because that's as, as, as easily that those terms come off the tongue for us, it doesn't come off the tongue easily for everyone else, but right. they understand what white right. trash means, right? Which is how Russia views Ukrainians. And so I, my cultural experiences empower me and to, to provide those type of analogies to make everyone feel like mm. they can participate in the conversation because this work is about how do you make people feel about something? Because if they feel something, they might be compelled to believe that they can do something about it. And so when you ask me what sustains my resolve to be authentically Black and authentically myself, it's the confidence in, in, in my own intelligence, in my own experiences, that they are just valuable and as effective as everyone else, and as the results of my podcast and my 
appearances on mm. television reveal Absolutely it's definitely true. the case. I was gonna give you the horn real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you were just out here dropping serious bars. I hope everybody who's watching this live right now, or maybe you're watching the rerun on YouTube, I hope that you are taking notes because Terrell is giving you life lessons. I don't care if you black, white, Middle Eastern, whatever you are, these are absolutely critical thoughts. And the two things that you said that really resonated so deeply with me, one, that your best work happens when you really lean into yourself. You lean into your background and your lived experience. That's so important for so many people, especially people coming from marginalized communities who are so often made to think that our experiences are less than, that our existence is less than. Actually, everything that you grew up with, your background, your family, your lived experience, Actually, those are all of your assets. Those are all of the things that will propel you to have this incredible career in the same way that you have, Terrell. That just resonates so deeply with me. And also you speaking to creating a dialogue and creating a conversation that everybody can engage in and that everybody can be a part of. You know, that's, that's, that's also literally what I'm trying to do here with Nikki Man's Live by yeah. having a different guests from a different country every week. You know, someone from Iran, someone from Nigeria, someone from Sudan, someone from Tanzania, someone from Mexico, because the only way that we are going to start to bridge these gaps and to eradicate the intolerance that exists in the world, to eradicate these wars, right, is when we start to get to know each other, one and, you know, one another much better. And uh, we start to understand and, and understand that lived experience. So thank you for sharing that, Terrell. That's, that's spot on. Yeah. I'm, I'm living for this. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah, of course. So let me just take a quick note and say, everybody, if you're not following Terrell on Instagram yet, you need to go do that right now. You can literally go to the top of your screen, hit that little white arrow. You're going to be able to go follow at Terrell J Star so you can continue to follow his awesome work. You can follow me on Instagram as well at They Call Me Bands. I just want to shout out some of the people who are here on the IG Live. I see that Dana today is in the chat saying this is so insightful and saying that you can have that duality. Um, in, in life and saying that she loves that. And I saw that um, Adam the Torpedoes is saying, I want my kid to keep all of this in his mind about he can be black and a diplomat if he wants as he grows up. So that's some, that's some beautiful feedback there, Terrell. <laughs> Excellent Ooh, indeed. Excellent. <laughs> and I think your parallel, you know, of your uncles being the first diplomats is is brilliant, right? Because it's it's true. Anyone who has this kind of cross-cultural capital, social capital, who is able to sell their version of whatever they're trying to give you, that that's that is <laughs> that is diplomacy, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and that, and that's the thing, right? I want people to know that ultimately foreign policy is about how you want the world to be. It's planned. So you think about these conflicts uh, right now, you take Sudan, Sudan, for example, so much of what's happening there, uh, you know, you, the, right. one of the newest countries in the world is South Sudan, right? right? Or if you think about Israel and Palestine, these country, these conflicts in these countries in most situations were exacerbated negotiated however you want to frame it by western Absolutely. powers colonial powers right and israel is a project a, a post-world war ii project right essentially right and we understand in the ways in which uh israel was carved up and palestinians were carved out all of that is by design you know um you can think about many you know country you know, asia the whole nine yards this world is carved up in urban planning the way that our cities are designed, the neighborhoods that are here and there, all of these are by design. The, the neighborhoods that we live in, someone decades ago, five years ago, planned that community. And what most people don't know is that as citizens, mm -hmm. we have the right to determine what that planning is. What we don't know is that many of these decisions are made at our city council, uh, city council meetings public records that are as that are accessible but people may not feel that way right. because they don't feel smart right. enough right to do it and what black diplomats is designed to do is to tell everyone regardless of your race that you're smart enough to have a say in how you want your mm. world to look all, all i do if you're if, it, if, if if it's the city government all i'm doing it's telling you this is what's going down in the city council building. If you're talking about the world, one of the basic foundations of getting into that beyond re media and reading 
and if looking at the decision makers is your congressperson. You know, all you know the the thing about this country, the the the, the genesis of this country as racist, as sexist, as homophobic as the foundation has been, the spirit of it is actually pretty good. You know, um, and and. And what it is is that it's a participatory, um, a participatory government. We have to actively participate. We have to actively engage the people who take our, who who are paid with our right. tax dollars and spend them. And, and I, I want to get more people believing that they can engage in that. And, and I say this because I started okay. off as a local okay. news reporter. Yeah, yeah, I start, yeah. Before I did all this foreign affairs stuff, I wow. covered wow. local politics. I would go to every city council meeting in Champaign, Illinois, because that's where I, I started. Now I was in grad. I started reporting when I was in graduate school, and the types of information, the way I disseminated the reporting methodology, mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. not changed. It's up trend in the foreign policy, all mm -hmm. new. Is local, you know, and, and that predates the digital era, and it's going trying to move on to whatever era we enter in this digital phase, because everyone at any level pretty much needs to know why does this impact me, and and how can I participate in this so that my voice can be heard. It's local. And it's also universal, which is what I'm trying to do now. Everybody has a voice. And the biggest goal of Black diplomats is to tell people that with one voice together, especially if it's, you know, pursuing right, righteousness, our, right. our voice is louder together. It's, it's just, you know, Black diplomats are in is at the table mm, mm, leading that mm, conversation. Mm. Terrell, I'm so grateful for you sharing that and just reminding everyone that we do all have a voice, whether it's your local community, your city politics, your state, your city, um, or globally, that we all have a voice and we all have a say. Uh, you, the work that you're doing to cover Ukraine, to cover Sudan, to cover Iran is such a critical reminder that we are so much more interconnected than I think people would, would think that we are, than the way that sometimes traditional media makes it feel. Um, and that's exactly what you're doing with the Black Diplomats podcast, is connecting those dots around the world so that people know that our collective voice is stronger. And I like what you said, too, about pursuing righteousness, because I think sometimes with journalists, there is this idea that you need to be uh, impartial, that you need to be, you know, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. I'm, I'm not with it, but there's this idea that you should be impartial. But I had this amazing uh, journalist, Laurel Chor, who's actually done quite a bit of work um, in Ukraine as well. And when she came on the show, she said, um, she said, I'm not impartial. She said, I'm a journalist and I'm firmly on the side of human rights. And that's exactly what Black Diplomats is as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, uh, I think people who are impartial are those people right. who don't have any stakes. Just because I, as a journalist, my responsibility is to be fair. My responsibility is right. one right. to tell you the truth and not to lie. Right, right, right. right? That's that's the truth. number one. Okay, so I lie. And, and, and referring to that, we're not talking about what's going on at Fox with Tucker um, Carlson and all these people who flat out lie and they're irresponsible, right? I think that that's just a miscarriage of the profession. And I think that there, it needs to be penalized. That's how passionate I am about providing proper information to people because I never right. take, it, take it for granted that my full-time mm. job is to learn. I have books all around me. I'm reading all the time. Wow. I get paid to read. That is my, I get paid to share mm -hmm. information. I have, I have no excuse to deliver information that's not true or accurate. It happens. I mean, as far as I, you can make mistakes, but to deliberately mislead mm -hmm. people. So that's the passion that I come in with. And I think that people really need to understand in this day and age that um, we are 
dealing with a major we're, we're dealing we're dealing with uh things where in sudan for example this is a migration story i i noticed the way that the world responded to ukrainians who were fleeing into europe versus the circumstances of how the Sudanese are being treated, just the type of coverage, right? And I know this because I was in Ukraine at the very beginning, and I'm going back to Ukraine now, mm. and I'm going to be there, based there for about a year and a half. But um, the first thing I saw in Sudan is like, God, the ways that the governments are responding to people. Right. You have to ask yourself, why is that? And frankly, I think that there is a I, I really think that race plays a major role in this. I definitely feel that people, I think people genuinely were interested in my analysis and my, my reporting because I'm good at what I do. But I also think that there is something about a white face and a white young child for so many people who consume international news that resonates with them. And there's an implicit yep. bias of care. I really believe, you know, and, and because and I noticed that the, the lack of difference in care and coldness that was extended yep. towards the people yep. of color who fled. I, I, the person I interviewed who was black for this series that I'm going to be releasing in the fall, they're spread all, all across Europe. Every last one of them cried about mm. their mistreatment. It was very difficult mm. to, to cover. You know, it, you know, for me, like just taking it in, it's, it's difficult so i'm not going to be i'm not going to be impartial in my analysis about this they dealt with pure unadulterated hate yep. and racism that's what it is and, and i think that people who have stakes don't have the time or the flexibility to intellectualize right. racism it's just racism we don't have time to intellectualize stupidity right. when people are just stupid. <laughs> right. We don't we don't have we don't have time and we don't have the bandwidth to tiptoe around these things because our survival depends on us calling the thing that a thing. Part. Terrell, yeah. I, I I literally feel like I could talk to you for a, another hour. I hope that I I <laughs> I, I know that picture. Uh, I can put that are you sure? Yourself. Okay. Yeah, I'm positive. Okay, yeah, I can okay. do it right now. Well, I, honestly, yeah, we're good. I um, I'm so blown away by the way that you're able to articulate these things because I think for so many people of color, we are trying to be competitive in a space that demands us to talk a certain way about things, to tiptoe around things, like you said, and for you to be so um to be so brave, really, to just tell it like it is and to call a spade a spade and say, this is hate, this is racism. We're seeing this in Palestine. We're seeing this in uh, the world's reaction and government reactions to the Sudanese crisis versus what's happening in Ukraine. You know, that's the type of thoughtfulness and that's the reality that comes with having that lived experience like you have as a man of color to then be reporting on this as opposed to other media outlets that don't have people of color, that don't have people who, who have stakes in the game, like you've, like you've so um, beautifully said. So I'm, I'm glad that you shared that. And I'm super curious. I want to ask you about, you mentioned a couple of series, you've mentioned a couple of things that you have coming up. You know, talk to us now about sort of what's on the horizon so that everybody who's here watching this on Nikki Vans Live or, or watching on YouTube can, you know, keep an eye out and continue to support all the work that you're doing and continue to, to also share and amplify the stories that you have being published uh, in the coming months. Well, thank you. So I currently am working on two major projects that are in various stages of development. One uh, project is a five-part series that uh, on Iran, is, and it's tentatively, the title is uh, Iran in Context, but that name is going to change. But I'm interviewing, I've, I've interviewed five Iranians um, who are experts in their particular fields, um, but it's not an, it's not an academic um, um, series. It's a narrative, This America Life, NPR-style um, you know, um, narrative written um, series. 
And it really challenges how I once thought about Iran. And it challenges Western mm. thinking wow. about the country, right? So the first person who I interrogate mm. in this series is myself. I want people to feel safe and in, in, in believing that they can grow, right? Because so many of us like to, to kind of educate and teach people with, you know, hey, this is where I am, but we don't right. like to talk about our growth process. And so this bond series is really going to delve into not only what America has gotten wrong, what, what the West has gotten wrong, but what did I get wrong when, when, when these conflicts mm -hmm. came across my television screen? And so you 20 years of growth that I've taken to really become the person that I am and understand this region. But the main voices will be the five Iranian people. And what and I keep saying Iranian because so often white mm. male voices are leading these conversations. In my opinion, mm. there are none in there. It's just great Iranians and then it's them talking about their country to me. I'm just narrating and facilitating them. The other series I have going on is called Fleeing Ukraine While Black. It's an eight-part series so far, maybe nine, in which I talk about um, what it's like to be a Black refugee. The foundation is Ukraine, but I talk about the racism and the, the structural inequities and how a non-white refugee is treated. And that one's, you know, and so the, there, I profile Black Ukrainians and how often have we heard the actual Black Ukrainian voice so I'm going to have multiple voices from that that will be featured. I'm also going to interview, um, you know, and there are also going to be themes in different countries. So I travel to Germany, Poland, France, uh, Portugal, England. And so you're going to understand how all these black people are experiencing the EU and their policy very differently, but it's all, but it's going to be lead, be led by voices and, and then it's going to be form. And so it's going to be, very engaging and pull you in and i'm going to also wow. be returning wow. to ukraine in june and i'll be doing a lot of frontline reporting so i'll be embedded mm -hmm. with military units and so you'll see a lot of video from me and the you know and, and we're, we're these uh ukrainian soldiers fending off russia right so uh, so you'll see me in my helmet and my bulletproof vest and you know, and, and uh, I'll be doing that. I'm very much looking forward to that because I think people really need to understand what war looks like because what my hope is and the way my storytelling is designed is that hopefully if we see enough of this, we will want to make right. sure that we avoid it. And I think the spirit of every foreign correspondent ought to be that way. I think that I, I wish, I, I, I really believe in our humanity and that exists. The work that I'm doing, that I will be doing in Ukraine, mm. it needs to be obsolete because we will have evolved as human beings to where we will stop right. killing each other. Um, I'll also be doing um, some work on people who have disabilities. And we, you know, we rarely hear about people who have various physical disabilities mental disabilities, et cetera. So that work will be there. You'll see a lot of work, a lot of video on, on my Instagram. And I've just really started using it last year. And now I'm getting into a new level where my producer mm -hmm. is going to be doing multiple videos a week. And that's just going to expand. And then my podcast, Black Diplomats, it is on every podcast platform I, it's on it's on Apple iTunes. It is on Spotify. It's on Stitcher. It's everywhere. So that those are the primary places where you can see me. Also, you can catch me on Twitter, which is uh, my name, my government name, Terrell J Star. You know, my, the at Terrell J Star, and the same thing for Instagram right here. So I'm pretty <laughs> much easy to find. I love that you said you're. And, 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 and you know, and I'm also when I'm when I you know you'll start seeing me on on the major network, CNN, MSNBC, more, and eventually one of those places hopefully will pick me up um, on a regular basis, and so I'll be on one. 
but you can find me on, you'll be uh, eventually finding me on those networks Absolutely. more often as well. Well, we are 100% putting it out into the universe that the major networks are looking at you. We already know that you're featured on CNN, Al Jazeera, MSNBC, all these platforms. But we're definitely going to put all the good vibes out that you get picked up by one of these platforms as well. And I have to say, you know, as as yeah. a black Iranian, I am incredibly excited for your series on Iran, and particularly given the conflict that's happening in Iran uh, right now, the, the, the similar struggle for human rights, for women's rights, to be able to hear from Iranian voices is going to be so amazing and so critical. And like you said, a voice uh, that is oftentimes not heard in the United States or in other places around the world, hopefully voices that will shift people's perspectives um, of Iran. And, you know, the same with your upcoming content about Sudan. Obviously, you're working in Ukraine is world renowned. And, you know, the fact that you not only lived in Ukraine, you know, years ago when you were younger, but, you know, or actually there last year at the beginning of the war, you're going back now, you're going to be on the front lines. Um, th these things are so critical and taking it a step further to amplify the stories of the Black Ukrainians. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that um, for people of color globally, it was immediately clear that that uh, non-POC Ukrainians were being treated differently than the POC. And for you to go mm -hmm. in, take those stories, amplify them is going to be so important because it's one thing to sort of hear stories and see, see stories shared on social media, for example, which sometimes the bigger traditional media outlets try and... Um, you know, make seem like it's 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 uh, it's not as big of a deal or it's not as important as we say it is. So for you as a legit journalist right. to go and share those stories, they they can't ignore it now, right? And so we're really, mm -hmm. I am really excited about that, Terrell. I mean, you know, I I thank you, and it's my my duty. And what's unfortunate is that other journalists, regardless of what race they are, they don't feel it's theirs. That's what's unfortunate, right? You know, and when this war broke out, and I don't tell people this because I, I just don't think it's necessary, but I'm telling you because I think it provides context to what, you know, what we're talking about and the point I'm going to make is that one, what drives me to do the work that I do is my faith. I really believe in that. I'm, I'm a spiritual person. And if anyone has their hand out and they need help, I don't care what color it is, mm -hmm. I'm going to extend it and lift mm -hmm. you up. I believe that, right? And I, I truly, it's definitely in my heart to do that. I have the emotional bandwidth to care. When I helped the first family that I and my good friend Andre to flee, it was a mother with her twin mm -hmm. daughters. They were terrified. They were so terrified because they were in a town where the Russians were approaching and they were being bombed. They were wow. in the basement for multiple days. I mean, they, I mean and these children, mm -hmm. like the fear on their face, it was heartbreaking. You know, and even with me, like I'm a very kind of self-contained person, but even for me, it, it makes you break because you don't like to see human beings suffer like that. And so in, in addition to taking them out of the country, I documented their stories. You know, they said it's okay. And I have a whole bunch of photos that will be released eventually in the fall. But um I didn't hesitate. What's really tragic about this world that we live in, what's tragic about anti-blackness and anti-whiteness is that when black people were in that same position, so many people hesitated. So many, many people were restrained and they didn't have those same feelings. And the reason why I do the work that I do is that I, I want to model mm. the world that I want mm. to be in. So I'm not, I'm not impartial. I'm not impartial. And, and I, look, I, I grew up in the blackest city in the United States, uh, Detroit, Michigan. By race, you know, and population and size, it has been the largest black, black city for decades. Mm. 
I went mm. to a historically mm. black college. I know where my roots are. Mm. I know where they are. And as far as I know, I'm going to die black, right? I, as far as I know. Um, and with that said, nothing that I, I have done in my experience has taught me that I should mm. not care for my fellow human being. Because the whole point of fighting anti-blackness and fighting racism and white supremacy, and the reason why I'm so passionate about it on my show, all forms of abuse. That's why I'm passionate about Palestine. I've been to Palestine. It's apartheid. What they're doing to those people, it is sickening. It is it was one of the most dehumanizing experiences that I felt in my life, and it wasn't even directed towards me. It is inhumane. And our government, in its own way, is actively yep. participating in it. That's the truth. That is the truth. That is impartial right there. Okay? There are so many inequities that are taking place. So as much as I support America supporting Ukraine because they should because Putin is a genocidal maniac. That is what he is. He wants to exterminate Ukrainians. Mm. He is a racist. He, he is a supremacist in his own in, in his own form. Russian supremacy, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are the same thing. And and, and and what I want to model is a world in which all of us are fighting all of it because mm. it hurts mm. All of us. And, and covering local elections, I've covered, this is going to be my third presidential. Uh, um, and I have been to some of the poorest counties, communities in this country that were all white. When I went to West Virginia several years ago, I didn't mm. think that white people could be that poor and downtrodden. But my point is that the same type of oppression that they vote for is oppressing. Woo! Okay. Woo okay. Okay. So, 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 what I want to do, and, and and with this work, is show you how, mm. how universal hate is. I want to create a universal, uh, and I want to create a universal thinking where once we come together we can fight all this because once we're all once one of us are free we are free my freedom equals yours your freedom equals mine because that same oppressive route that takes one of us down we need to reflexively fight it because oppression in one end of the world is not going to equal complete freedom in yours that is my message that is the point of black diplomats and every single day those are the marching orders for all of my listeners, how we can be better citizens of this world together and stewards of peace that will mm. protect all Terrell of us. Terrell J. Starr, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Honestly, Terrell, I, I don't even want to follow up with anything because that was the most beautiful ending, the perfect way to remind all of us that this hatred that we fight right now is universal and that it is all of our responsibility to be our own diplomats, to take action and to be conscious about mm -hmm. the hate in Ukraine, in Palestine, in South Africa, in Iran, in all of these places. And that my freedom equals your freedom as well. And I mean, that's just, just it's so powerful, Terrell. And I'm so thankful and grateful that you discovered this voice of yours when you were nine years old or however old you were and that you stuck with it and that you have amplified <laughs> it across the world because yours is a voice that we need to continue hearing. And it has been my absolute honor to be able to share this dialogue and to hold space with you today here on this show. So thank you. Thank you so much in your voice, uh, even providing your platform for me to share mine is equally as valuable and the stage that we share together as well. And I'm thankful for that. And the two of us together, Peace Corps, this is the experience and these are, this is what- This Peace is Corps it, produces, this right? is it. Us. I'm about to take a clip of this and make it a real yeah. and tag Peace Corps, that this is what it's all about, right? World <laughs> Peace right. and Friendship, Nicole Bannister and Terrell J. Starr, everybody. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you.
Terrell, have a beautiful Ew. rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Make sure you follow Terrell on Instagram at Terrell J Star. Make sure you're following me on Instagram at They Call Me Bands. And we'll see you next Tuesday for the next episode of Nikki Bands Live. Bye, Terrell. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.